Hello and welcome to a special segment. Media is the fourth and the final pillar of democracy. Democracy itself has been buried beyond belief since October 26 in the Lankan context. To discuss and debrief more on press freedom, the role press has got to alleviate the political pandemonium, College of Journalism has got a very special, the former female editor, in fact the first editor of Sunday Observer, a very respected, recognized and award-winning senior journalist. She was also the past political columnist for the Daily Financial Times. Correspondent. She is none other than Darisha Bastians. Thank you very much for accepting our invitation. Happy to have you on board. To start off with, what prompted you to become a journalist? Uh, I think it was an accident, largely. I was after my uh, A-levels and I was kind of looking for something to do between then and university. And, uh, I walked into a radio newsroom and did a voice test and just became a presenter. And it happened to be Capital Radio, which had uh, very senior journalists working there, professional journalists who later went on to join Reuters and Associated Press. So the training I got there, and it was a volatile time with the war, so it was kind of baptism by fire into kind of, you know, learning to cover conflict and uh, emergency situations. So I kind of hooked, and from then on, it, I couldn't imagine doing anything else. Uh, probably you were the first female editor of a leading newspaper. How did you tie over yourself over the male-dominated industry? newspaper, I think there have been several female editors who have blazed a trail. Uh, honestly, to tell you the truth, I have not faced this male dominance uh, in newspapers the way that sometimes it is portrayed. I have always been able to hold my own in an editorial. Um, certainly there is a, there's a, female editors are in a minority. But in the newspaper industry, in particular in Sri Lanka, I think you'll find that many desk positions, editorial, many journalists handling editorial desks are in fact females. And many senior journalists are in fact females. It's just that when it eventually comes to breaking that barrier to become editors, uh, all of the stereotypes about the fact that women are difficult to work with, the fact that women are more competitive or cutthroat or you know, all of those things tend to, I think, maybe come into the picture. So people prefer the placid male, maybe, than the, that that could be one reason. But I, I honestly can't say for sure. Uh, my time at the Observer, I, I didn't encounter resistance because I was female. Uh, I found all of my team members very cooperative. And all of them really willing to kind of uh, try to do this different style of journalism at a state-owned or publicly-owned newspaper. Um, and I think in, I was there for a very short time, just eight months, but in that time I think we did show that even a publicly-owned or a state-owned or an apparently government-aligned newspaper can uh, do honest uh, journalism, can be truth-tellers. So that was, I mean... Right, okay. Please compare the standards of reporting in terms of Lankan, Asian, and world on the whole. Well, I think that, see, reporters are essentially a product of their mentor, mentoring systems, right? And uh, at uh, College of Journalism is one great initiative that we actually have a kind of a training. Uh, but many journalists actually learn on the go. Many are, in fact, people who have entered the field by accident. Uh, and uh, who then have to uh, learn as they go in the job. So there's no it has been that, it, that I think is can be a limiting factor for many reporters. Uh, another big issue I find is a problem with mentorship for mid-career journalists. Like myself, for instance, I need mentors. I am still learning. I have a long way to go, probably another 30 years in the field, which means I need uh, I need help, I need to make my work better, I need to write better, I need to report better, and I don't have sources uh, for training. 
So that is a big issue. I think at all you find at all media institutions that there is no real mentorship, no role models that will then t once you have reached a particular stage to take you to the next level. Uh, that is a problem I think Sri Lanka media faces, uh, and these are the counterparts in the world. It is that kind of you know the ethical training, the uh, the training in those finer points of journalism. Uh, those things, we, we, I think we can still go, uh, we have a long way to go. But that's not to say that there aren't fantastic journalists yes. in the country. Right? I'm sure some of your trainers are excellent journalists. I mean, some of them have trained me, the Amanda mm -hmm. You know, they have they've taught us storytelling, they've taught us truth-telling, how to make a new story attractive. That, I mean, so... There have been, uh, I'm just saying that after you reach a particular point, uh, many Sri Lankan journalists do not have sources of training, uh, have no, so that then limits your potential to really become, you know, this international class or you know, reach those standards of reporting. The present political pandemonium has affected the society at large. What is the role of the press? To tell the truth, essentially. I think uh, it doesn't change as in with any other situation. Do not add to the noise, do not add to the chaos. Just stick to the fundamentals of journalism, which is truth telling. And I think to understand also in some ways, which I think sadly much of the mainstream press with a few exceptions have failed in this one month period, is to understand that democracy is central to your profession. As a journalist, if you don't understand that when the foundations of democracy are shaken, that it affects your ability to do your job, your ability to tell the truth, if you don't understand that, if you don't understand the repercussions of a constitutional coup and what it means for people to whom freedom of expression is central to their work, then, I mean, you're already starting, starting off on the wrong foot. Wrong. Right, you're already you're, you're already basically cutting off your nose to spite your face if you're going to support and back um, an illegal power grab or an illegal transfer of power. So I think, and, and that is not to say that everybody needs to go around shouting about the fact that it's a coup or anybody needs to black out uh, those who have illegally uh, taken on power, but it is to represent every side. For instance, to stop uh, behaving like much of the media is doing, mm. to stop behaving as if the executive is the only branch of government in the country, to, be, to understand and to explain to readers, to audiences, that there are three branches of government, that the executive, the legislature and the judiciary are equal, separate but equal power bases of authority in the country. And you cannot simply ignore the speaker's ruling and go by government gazettes. You, you simply cannot do that. And, and if, it, if that is not the role of the media. The role of the media is to represent the speaker's view also, to represent the, will, to represent the will and the verdict and the expression of the legislature in as much as it is to explain what the executive branch is doing. So I would think, yeah, we have a central role. We have to understand, uh, we, we need to, I mean, this one big debate that's going on right now is why is the media referring to Mahindra Rajapaksa as Prime Minister? The parliament has moved two no confidence motions against him. It is not up to the president uh, to accept or reject the verdict of parliament. Uh, parliament is supreme in that ruling. The speaker is supreme. His ruling cannot be challenged in court. His ruling cannot be challenged by the executive. Therefore, Parliament has spoken, and under the terms of the Sri Lankan Constitution, the cabinet has ceased to exist. So there is no government. So as a journalist, it's fundamental to our reporting to understand those tenets of the Constitution, to understand what it means when Parliament passes a no-confidence motion. Why would you continue to call the person who Parliament has decreed no longer holds the post of Prime Minister as Prime Minister. Now, as media, you have to find ways to frame it, right? Mm -hmm. How do you refer, the government is continuing as a de facto government, irrespective of the will of Parliament. So then, as a journalist, how do you frame it? How do you, there are words you can use, right? Controversially appointed, 
disputed, perpetrated prime minister, perpetrated cabinet, but we don't see the media doing media. this. These are simple things, right? When the newspaper reports that cabinet has met, really the very the easiest thing you can do is put cabinet in quotations. quotations. The moment you do that, your credibility, and you don't, you are not seen as an appendage of the executive. You are seen as, as a independent that is also understanding that while there is a de facto government and those things must be reported on, parliament has spoken and therefore there is no cabinet. So the moment you put it in inverted commas and say cabinet or prime minister, the whole, you know, you stop getting this criticism that you are somehow uh, participants or stakeholders in the coup. So I think there are nuances of reporting and I think it's up to senior journalists to set those guidelines for editors to begin to explain to their reporters why this is a problem and why we need to report a particular way. On that note, there is this unusual situation Sri Lanka is stuck in that <coughs> initially there was 1 p.m., 2 p.m. and following a.m. no p.m. So in your opinion, is there officially and ethically a p.m. or no p.m.? Okay, so if I, this, is, this is where the complexity comes in, right? So to begin with, the removal of Prime Minister Nayarikram Singha remains unconstitutional and illegal according to legal experts and constitutional experts, according to the terms of the 19th Amendment. Nayarikram Singha was not legally removed, right? But what you have is this de jure and de facto situation. So by in law, Rani Vikram Singha remains Prime Minister of Sri Lanka because he was not legal anymore. But de facto, on the ground, there has been, I mean, we also live in the real world now. Uh, Rani Vikram Singha's ouster is being challenged separately, legally, as a constitutional matter. <coughs> Parliament uh, took a different route. Parliament went by the Gazette in seating uh, Mahindra Rajpaksa in the Prime Minister's seat on the 14th of November, went by the Government Gazette but immediately subjected him to a flow test. <coughs> okay. It, in some ways, tantamount to accepting that appointment as a de facto appointment, I mean, that is what the situation is in the country today, accepted it, but immediately defeated him in a flow test, making his appointment completely null. He, he is no longer prime minister. Even if he purportedly, if he was appointed purportedly illegally into that position by the executive, he, by virtue of losing a no confidence motion or a flow test in parliament, ceases to be prime minister. So parliament has taken a very different tack. So it's understandable that it is difficult to understand this, right? So technically on the ground, there is no prime minister if we take the de facto situation. But Rani Vikram Singh's ouster remains illegal. So he continues mm. to be the de jure or prime minister in law. Okay. Yeah, but I, I mean, it's complicated and not a constitutional issue. <laughs> Giving politics a brief rest, mm -hmm. an Al Jazeera journal is behind bars by the Egyptian authority indefinitely. Khashoggi was eliminated brutally. Are journals' life at stake? Um, I think press freedom is under attack in all parts of the world. I think that, that is what we need to understand. At the, uh, obviously, at differing degrees. Uh, we have completely brutal, completely uh, autocratic, oppressive regimes uh, that then make free uh, expression completely. Uh, yeah, it's impossible to be a journalist in certain regimes. But I mean, people keep trying and then suffer for it. And then you have the other side of the US, where the press is under attack in a very different way in the US as well. And our own experiences with press freedom is. You know, I mean, it, we have a bloody history of how we treat truth tellers, how we treat dissidents, how we treat people who do not want to uh, follow the accepted conventional line. So, yeah, I mean, it's a, it's always a risk if you choose to uh, stand apart, if you choose to rebel, if you want to call out wrong things as wrong, if you want to stand against injustice. You, I think journalists, that is their role, right? There's no point in being a journalist and going with the flow. No, the whole idea that you choose a professional profession like journalists is because you, you clearly have, you feel like that something has to change, right? If, if systems were perfect, why do you need newspapers? Mm. So it's because that it, systems are imperfect. 
and we need to call out those imperfections and that is our role to call out the imperfections to perform a check and balance on uh, state power and we will always i think if we are doing our job right we will always fall afoul of uh, autocrats and authoritarian uh, regimes that that i think is how do your good self see media freedom locally in comparison globally so i mean we've had i think maybe some sort of respite over the past year and a half years uh, in the sense that nobody got abducted nobody got killed nobody got beaten up for being a journalist uh, but in terms of i mean all the rankings all the indices are quite indicative that press freedom remains a huge problem in sri lanka and i mean we have we have kind of stark examples in front of us that you know it's very easy to slip back into it because it's been done before with the richard disorders my own first ila sandeep kumar was my first editor he was killed uh keith noya his picture is here i mean keith noya he was my deputy editor at the nation abducted a night of complete night terror night for us as we were not sure whether he would come back um so many colleagues who have been abducted beaten um gone through so much just you know because they decided to stand against an oppressive regime and regimes that have gone before i'm not saying that the rajapaksa regime is the first uh, first uh, assailant on media freedom we have a long history the premada saira we've had so it's a checkered history it's a long way before i think uh, people in positions of state authority can accept that the media performs a fundamental independent role and uh, that is not to be challenged uh, through violence uh, but you know by, by if if you have problems with journalists i think the biggest problem i think the previous i mean the regime that was ousted on uh, 26th october bad was that the media was not being fair by then right and i think that there are ways to fix that look at ownership look at media ownership how how does that work how does that affect the journalist ability to do their job uh, i know many uh, colleagues at uh, local tv st- stations who are appalled at the way this crisis is being covered but they have no choice the instructions have come from proprietors with political interests so i mean i think it's a big like it's a big problem in terms of training uh, in terms of ownership uh, in terms of mentorship all of these things uh, come together to create this perfect storm of you know whatever and i think uh, whatever states feel is the problem with journalists right so i think the way forward definitely even if you are a responsible government is to uh enhance capacity building for journalists find ways that journalists can be trained so that they can stand up to unfair proprietors right if you go in and you're going to work at a tv station that's going to tell you to do blatantly wrong things mm. as a journalist to tell untruths to fabricate you have to have the integrity to say no right no i'm not doing this i mean the job alone is not worth Uh, losing everything i stand for so i think for us to get to that stage it involves you know professionalizing journalism making sure our pay is better making sure our options are better uh, all of those things they to come together to finally uh, you know for us to really perform this role as a fourth estate so there you go <coughs> the message comes that put your foot down if you are asked to stand and say that you are right Moving on, what have been the challenges and hardships you have encountered while carrying out your duties? Um, well, honestly, I have I can't say that I have had uh, many challenges. Obviously, it was difficult uh, during the period 2005 to 2015 for every journalist uh, when we had to self censor, when we had to uh, to always be cautious that there were certain people that kept could not be reported about uh to watch colleagues being attacked it was hard i mean when lasanta was killed it was a very stark message to all of us any of us 
who are do it, trying to do independent journalism that you know this is the price you're going to have to pay and uh, nobody who wants to pay that price nobody nobody wants to make that sacrifice right nobody you ask anybody in the corporate sector if they're willing to lay down their lives for their job they're not only journalists do this right and choose to tell the truth anyway so that I think that time was particularly challenging for journalists because you realized, I think, with Lasanta's death, I'm talking about contemporary journalists. Well, I mean, I know that older senior journalists have seen much more. But uh, for people like us who worked with Lasanta, who know Lasanta to have been a, a contemporary media figure, I think that death brought about a kind of a, a real shell shock, like about how we do our job and and how how do you stay out of uh, the way of a regime that's going to be so brutal. And um, so that time I think was challenging and I still feel like to, uh, La Santa was killed on uh, 2009 January. Totally. The war came to an end in May of yes. the same year. And I think, I mean, I don't know whether subconsciously that contributed to the way we reported on the war. Whether La Santa's death, I still think that we didn't bear witness to the end of that war properly. I, I think we failed there. I think as, as a community uh, committed to truth telling, uh, we failed. Uh, we failed people in the North. We failed, uh, we failed our job. I mean, yes, because it was repressive. But, I, and that's what I'm saying, I mean, that was the fundamental challenge. Do you tell, you knew what, we knew what was happening. All of these UN reports that came out later, Journalists all knew what was happening in April and May 2009. I knew. But there was no way I could say, I, could, I couldn't write it. Uh, not without a risk of what happened to Keith, what happened to Lassant. I mean, it was, there, it was not possible. So, uh, so those are, I think, the challenges. I mean, in the, at the same time, I think we got braver as time went on. I think by 2013, reporting on impeachment and things like that, people got much braver. Um, and of course 2015 happened because journalists also stood up, right? Stood up and they were counted and they, I mean, look at the way journalists covered Valley Valley. That was during the, the Rajpaksa time, but if you recall, Hiru, I think the Hiru footage was the most phenomenal footage of, shoot, of soldiers shooting into the crowd. Those were journalists working under very repressive conditions. So. I think we have all gone through this cycle and maybe come out stronger, braver, learning to do, uh, to find loopholes mm -hmm. around mm -hmm. repression, uh, to find do detours to doing our job. I mean, I remember there was a time when we would always say, you know, because you start off with the military denial when there's an abduction or when there is some human rights violation. How you report is you start off with the denial and mm. that gives you then the opportunity to tell the backstory. Right? So it's, there have been difficult times and then there has been the last three and a half years where you pretty much reported anything and got away with it. And uh, so I guess it's an ebb and flow. Any <laughs> journalist with his or her salt can take, right? Because it's, it was just beyond, uh, beyond the pale. It was not, you cannot tolerate it. And I think that ultimately, those are one of the thousand cuts I've written a lot of times about how regimes die, or, or, or dictators die by the, not by one, not with this one uh, swish of a blade, but by a thousand cuts. And each time you 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 overreach, or you abuse power, or or you uh, you kind of oppress. I think that results in one cut that ultimately leads to your fall. La Santa, Pragit, Keith, Upali, all of them, I think, were cuts that led to the Rajapaksa regime's fall. And we would be smart not to forget it. <laughs> Spreading the spotlight slightly on female journalists, what is the biggest reason behind only a handful of female journalists? I'm sorry, but this may not uh, fit with your question, but I don't think there's a handful of female journalists. Do you see that in newsrooms is the question. I, newsrooms are filled with female journalists. The problem is, and I think like many editors really like female journalists because 
they are driven they are kind of more i mean many female colleagues i know are way more driven than men, male counterparts uh, far more kind of aggressive far more uh, uh, diligent and uh, willing to speak truth to power uh, not to not not to you know i'm not i don't yes. mean to put down males but i have found that many and many senior journalists today are females so i think that newsrooms are full of female journalists it's just that how do you get uh, these newsrooms that are full filled with interns and cub reporters and you know feature writers who are female to come to this position of being able to run a desk uh, a serious current affairs desk uh, uh, to do serious political reporting, to do serious legal reporting. I think those are the ones. We still have like very senior hands in newspapers, female, male, who uh, still dominate because they are still the kind of, they are the experts. You don't find that expertise uh, building in the younger, uh, younger cadre of journalists because ultimately journalism is seen as, uh, it's seen as a transitionary profession. It doesn't pay well enough. It's seen as risky. Uh, it, the options are limited. You have a handful of newspapers, a handful of uh, TV stations. So uh, I think that again the idea is professionalize so that uh, all journalists who enter the field can really find ways to build their skill levels and uh, become experts in their own field, whatever chosen sphere of re reporting. So the good news is that there is a balance and in, in editorials a female journalist can breathe a sigh of relief because a situation of gender balance is forming. Now given the October 26 saga and limited media freedom, do you sense a change in the field? I think if, if the status quo is here to stay, I think we can definitely look forward to it. Uh, we are already seeing that I mean, many times for personal interest, for the for reasons of personal interest, we find the media having uh, howled down uh, in the face of this crisis. Uh, but there are also hope. I, th I think there is hope because there, there are certain newspapers that are standing out, certain television stations that are standing out for courageous reporting. Uh, but certainly if uh, this status quo remains, I think you can be almost certain that a crackdown will happen. We are already seeing a resurgence of impunity uh, the, with this, you know, the return of certain men, the attempted transfer of a very senior CID officer who was in charge of many of these investigations. Uh, we are seeing, you know, the highest military official just walking into the Navy mess and threatening a witness. So impunity certainly is going to come back because those that was a hallmark of this previous regime. So if that's this October 26 status quo remains, I think we have to look forward to difficult times as journalists. And the final question, what is the take home message to the budding journalist? Um, the only thing I can think of is just be the best that you can be because you have journalists and you have journalists, but I think that as a young reporter, like be as willing as possible to learn, uh, be willing to write or report, I don't know, broadcast, whatever, in just everything. Just be, become like, you know, a jack of all trades at the beginning and then decide what you want to be your specialty. But learn, just be ready to learn. And I think even going up, I, I don't think it's just a message to young journeys. I think it's for all of us. Like we, uh, we all need to keep learning, right? Keep getting better at what we do. And just remember that your fundamental purpose, if you are a journalist, your fundamental role is to be a truth teller. Tell the truth, no matter the consequences. And I think if you manage to do that, then you are performing whatever social role that a journalist is supposed to. There you, there you go. The home message, take home message that is worth recalling is be willing to learn, be a lifelong student. And that's from the reporter who is a cream of the crop. And thank you very much for joining us, watching. Till next time, thank you.